Shadowlands has been out for a month or two now, so it's time to review the launch. First, we'll start off by going into a deep dive of everyone's new favorite feature of the expansion, the Covenants. Here's a little story for you. One of my favorite video games of all time is Ori and the Blind Forest. It's a Metroidvania with some of the best graphics, or aesthetics anyway, of any game that I played because it just personally appeals to me for some reason. Even though I hate nature, I don't like camping or going outside, but I do love the artwork and aesthetic of the Blind Forest. And when I first saw the Zone of Ardenwald, it totally gave me Ori and the Blind Forest vibe, so I was super excited to learn more about it. When I got into the alpha and was able to play through the zone, it also scratched another itch of mine, where there was tons of references to the Feywild from D&D lore, and the Midsummer Night Dream Shakespearean play, which is one of the only Shakespearean plays that I actually liked, that and Hamlet. And the leader of the zone is known as the Winter Queen, which is totally the name of one of the main deities in the Feywild in D&D, and the Winter Queen in D&D is evil. So I'm still suspicious of the Winter Queen in WoW as well, because you can't be the Winter Queen in the Feywild without something nefarious going on in the background. She's a little bit too nice, which just makes it even more suspicious. But that also means I totally love the zone and everything about it, and I was really excited to finally go Night Fae once the expansion launched. Then I started to play around with the Covenant ability for my Priest, and it was so bad that I couldn't bring myself to choose Night Fae once I hit max level and had to pick a Covenant. I really wanted to go Night Fae, I loved basically everything about the Covenant, and all I needed was for my ability to not be bad. It didn't even need to be good, just not terrible, and unfortunately I couldn't get over that threshold. The priest ability they have is called Fey Guardians, which on a long cooldown summons three fairies which go out and do things dependent on which spells you cast. Basically, it will reduce the damage of the last person you cast power shield on by 10% for the duration, it will increase the cooldown recovery of only the major cooldown for a class when you heal them with a direct heal, and the target which has your dot on it will give you half a percent of mana back every time you attack that target with a direct attack. Now, here's what's not very good about this. The 10% damage reduction is too minor for a 2 minute cooldown and too cumbersome to keep on a priority target. The cooldown reduction works only on one ability, and the cooldown it lowers for Disc Priest is actually useless since you don't want to lower its cooldown, since you combo it with other cooldowns or raid phases. And the mana it gives back is barely better than the Venthyr ability, and you have to go out of your way to get more mana back. The Venthyr ability on the other hand, also gives you mana when you use it. When you use Mind Games, the Venthyr Covenant ability, you can get up to 4% of your mana back, and since it has half the cooldown as a Night Fae ability, it can easily average out around the same amount of mana return based on real world usage, if not in actual sims. And the Venthyr Covenant ability doesn't require you to go through hoops to get the mana back. You just use it and it's immediately useful, and you get the mana back as well as having nice damage reduction to the target, which will heal the tank when it's on them, and it does so much damage that it combos so well with the Disc Priest rotation that it almost feels like it's a natural ability that's supposed to be part of the class. Instead of a clunky piece of garbage that requires you to go through hoops to get the best use out of one useful ability. And this is why I eventually just went Venthyr even though I really wanted to go Night Fae. Now, would people deny me from groups if I went Night Fae instead of Venthyr? No, probably not. They'd deny me because I'm a Dis Priest, and Dis Priests are garbage in Mythic Plus Dungeons. Not because of my Covenant. You don't really need your Covenant ability to heal like a god in raids, either. In raids, I could technically pick whatever I want, but I'd rather have a useful ability than a useless one, and that's just my personal preference when playing my class. The other two Covenants are fine too, but if I can't get my first choice of Covenant, then I'm going to pick whichever one's the best, and that's definitely Venthyr. So, even though I really wanted to make the RP choice with picking my Covenant, I unfortunately just couldn't bring myself to do it, and now I begrudgingly belong to the Venthyr. The Venthyr aren't half bad though, they do have nice aesthetic as well. I do really love the whole red and black vibe they have going on, and the vampire bat people look cool enough. I think they would be better if they didn't look so much like bat people and instead more like vampires, but whatever. The zones also look really cool, can't really knock at any points on that, but the mission table is straight garbage. As of making this video, I have still yet to complete a single Soul Ash mission because the Venthyr troops are just straight up worse than Night Fae and Necrolord ones. But at least the Kyrian can share in our pain of being useless at mission tables. I didn't unlock the Ember Court until like 4 weeks after launch because I just don't really care for it. It's fine and everything, I don't hate the Ember Court. I think it's actually a fun little minigame. It's just the quest to unlock it took so long that I gave up halfway through it because I just didn't care enough to unlock a fun little minigame. 
Although I think the only covenant ability that's actually useful is probably the Abomination Factory. So it's not like I would have had a more fun time if I had gotten Night Fae on that front. And the Venthyr have a few other things about their covenant which are subpar, but those are probably bugs and will be fixed when Blizzard gets back from their vacation. Overall, it's fine. The teleport ability is a lot of fun to have when you're in open world trying to get treasures or skip traps in Torghast, but I would have rather have had the Soul Shape instead in Night Fae. So all this to say, when it comes to Covenant abilities, the Covenants themselves, the whole feature which was the selling point of Shadowlands, I think it's alright. I don't think they did a good job of letting you pick whatever Covenant you want based on RP reasons, but I'd probably have a different opinion on that friend if I was able to pick Night Fae without having a useless ability. And even if I had to go with my second choice of Venthyr, they ain't half bad. I only have minor complaints to be honest, despite how much I've been complaining so far. Who cares about the mission table, really? So, I have to give the whole thing a 7 out of 10, bordering on a 6 out of 10. Could totally have just been like the Essence system, where you could swap between the abilities, and then allow us to pick whatever covenant you want based on aesthetic, or whichever second ability you wanted, since at least the teleport for Venthyr is more useful than something like Fleshcraft. Those poor Necrolords. And now, let's go into the zones, rating all of the Shadowland zones based on quests, aesthetic, and how they are to navigate. Basically, all of the zones are pretty great. I even like the Maw, which is something everyone else seems to hate. Just look at the grass in Bastion. I just kind of stop and stare at the grass whenever I'm running through the zone for a world quest. Obviously, I like Ardenwald the most out of all of them, but I also really like the architecture in Venthyr. And I even like the zone of Maldraxxus, which is usually a lot of people's least favorite one. Did you know? Maldraxxus doesn't have a single tree in the entire zone, because the place is basically just made of flesh and ooze. They did such a good job of keeping everything consistent that you probably never even noticed the lack of a single tree. So, when it comes to aesthetic of zones, it wouldn't be too hard to give it all a 10 out of 10. They usually don't go wrong when it comes to art, but what about the navigation of the zones? Since I have the Venthyr teleport ability, it's not that bad for me, but it could always be better. It's not as bad as navigating Nashtatar or Vashir, for example, but I wouldn't say the zones are particularly super easy either, so I guess it just leaves the quest in the zones? How are those? The quests? They're alright, I guess. It does have a nice little flow that ends in a rebellion plot with the Venthyr. There were a lot of fun little neat moments inside of it. I think the quest of Venthyr was probably the best, and the quest in Ardenwald was probably the worst, despite the fact that I love everything else about that zone. The only good part of questing was the very end of Ardenwald where you help Sarah. Maldraxxus was fun, Bastion was a great introduction, if a little boring at first. Really boring at first, actually. I remember I almost fell asleep during the questing when I was doing on the Alpha, until the introduction of the Forsworn and Maldraxxus invasion. All in all, the questing was alright. If I were to compare some of the best questing zones, like Sirumar, Silverpine Forest, or the Hillsbrack Foothills, it probably doesn't measure up to those, but it's not too far behind. I'd have to give it an 8 out of 10 when it comes to questing, kind of high-ish. So all in all, my total score for the zones and Shadowlands would be a 9 out of 10. Really good, not much to complain about, except for the Maw. Even though the Maw is pretty lore appropriate, in that you're not really supposed to like being there anyway. Let's go into raids and dungeons next. The raid is still pretty early, but a lot of people have already completed it. Castle Nathria is an excellent introduction raid, although WoW rarely has bad raids, so that's to be expected. The final boss is also a wonderful, charismatic creature who has a pretty interesting boss fight, instead of a disappointing one like Nazoth, and it was cleared in a reasonable amount of time during the World First Race. When it comes to the dungeons, I don't really hate any of them, although I haven't done a deep dive into Mythic Plus dungeons yet, but based on normal, heroic Mythic Zeros plus a handful of mid-tier Mythic Plus dungeons, I can say that there are no dungeons that I hate like Toldegore or Waycrest Manor for BFA. I should really make a video on the top 10 worst dungeons just so I can talk about how bad Toldegore was. Although, I can confidently say, none of the Shadowlands early dungeons would make it on the worst of video, because they're all pretty decent so far. Even the worst of the bunch is still better than Toldegore by miles, and I really like the other side dungeon. This is going to be one of my new favorites, everything about it, to the unique boss fights and Bomb Somdi cracking jokes the entire time is just excellent. I don't really have anything to complain about when it comes to raids and dungeons. So when it comes to raids and dungeons on their own, from the perspective of an early launch, 
I have to give them a 10 out of 10 for now. High marks. Obviously nothing is perfect, but I think reviewers are a little bit too hesitant to give things 10 out of 10s when there's just really good without any major complaints. Let's go over the gear of the expansion. Shadowlands tried to take a book from Classic WoW, reducing the amount of gear people could obtain, removing corruptions and titan forging from gear so you have BIS loot to shoot for, and having a much more reasonable version of the Legion legendary system. Plus, they added PvP vendors back to the game, and getting gear for PvP is so good that people are actually doing PvP for the first time in a long time in order to get gear for raiding in Mythic Plus dungeons, when usually it's the other way around. So obviously, gear in Shadowlands gets a 0 out of 10. Terrible, absolute garbage system, nobody likes it. This is what you would think if you went online to look about gear in Shadowlands anyway. Turns out, people like their loot pinatas. The same people who complained about getting gear too easy are not the same kind of people who complain about gear being too difficult to obtain in Shadowlands. It's almost like different people like different things, and just because Classic WoW had a version of the game where bosses only drop two pieces of loot for 40 people, doesn't mean people like that in the current version of the game when they're used to getting three times the amount. Personally, I'm in a mixed bag about this. I do like to get gear easy, but I also feel that gear loses its meaning very quickly when you get a full set very fast in the expansion. It was very easy in past expansions to get to a point where your gear wasn't really going to get any higher. At that point, you just did high level content for content's sake. Whenever you did get a loot drop, you'd only get excited if it was Titanforged. Although, with the lack of Titanforging, Making gear itself more scarce is a good way to make gear more exciting to get again, as you can't get to a point where your only upgrades are winning a lottery roll behind the scenes. It seems like a step in the right direction. I think in theory, it's better to be excited for an upgrade because it's a piece of gear that you want, that you knew was there, rather than getting a piece of gear to upgrade because it was Titanforged. Although, they probably dialed back a little bit too many knobs when they introduced the new gearing system. The weekly vault was an excellent step in the right direction. Nobody really liked opening their Mythic Plus dungeon for the week and getting a pair of boots for the 10th week in a row. And people really like the PvP vendors. And even the new legendary item system is a huge step above the Legion version, which was actually quite bad. What Shadowlands loot really needs is just one more little piece of deterministic rewards that you can get in PvE content. Something like a PvP vendor, but for Mythic Plus dungeons and raids. Maybe. Every time you kill the boss or complete a dungeon, you get some form of currency, which you could save up in order to buy a piece of gear for a slot that you have a low item level of. Maybe this currency could be in the form of one batch, so to speak, that you get each time you kill a boss for the first time. So even if you don't get a piece of gear at the end of the raid or Mythic Plus dungeon, you know you're slowly working towards a new piece of equipment anyway. Although as far as I know, World of Warcraft has never had a system like that before. So until they invent a brand new system where you can target pieces of gear by just playing the game the way you like, instead of hoping to get lucky and get a piece of gear that you want, then we're kinda stuck with an almost perfect gearing system, which is a huge improvement toward the last expansion. So for Shadowlands gear, they do a lot right, but they kinda took away too much gear too quickly, so I give it an average, above average score, 7 out of 10. Still better than the 4 out of 10 that I gave BFA gear in my BFA review. That score might even have been a little bit too high for some people in that video. Now, let's review Shadowlands Infinite Progression System. In Legion, they introduce a new form of progression in the game, where you can infinitely grind out a resource in order to always increase the power level of your character. An infinite progression system is a key feature to MMOs. RuneScape, for example, can constantly increase the power level of your character by going out and doing a whole bunch of random things. And generally, the progression system of the game is just getting better and better gear. With Legion and Battle for Azeroth, we had the artifact power, which would constantly increase the power level of one specific piece of gear, which in turn would increase the power level of your character. So the infinite progression system in Shadowlands for its launch gets a uh, question mark out of 10. That's because Shadowlands doesn't have one. They have the renown system, which isn't actually a progression system and more like a time gating system, where eventually you'll get everything unlocked and it's incredibly fast to catch up on if you have a new alt or switch covenants. Anima is just order resources. You don't actually need it to increase the power of your character, outside of grinding a thousand of it per week for renown. Soul Ash is needed to craft legendaries, but that's not an infinite progression system. Stygia can increase the power of your character with the sockets, but it's locked on how many you can actually farm per day, 
and you'll eventually get to a point where you have all sockets on your piece of equipment anyway. So Shadowlands just doesn't have one. They decided to remove an infinite progression system from Shadowlands to see how people would like it. Since people were fine with it in Legion, there were lots of controversies about artifact power, don't get me wrong, but they weren't as against it as they were in Battle for Azeroth. And I'm not going to give it a 10 out of 10 for not having an infinite progression system, because I think an infinite progression system can be fun if it's implemented well, since Diablo 3 is an excellent example of a fun infinite progression system which doesn't really work in WoW, because that one at least gets reset every season. Although even Diablo's infinite progression system is not without its controversies. So, steering clear of it by just not having one seems like a neat idea. Now, let's review new game features for Shadowlands. Shadowlands has a whole bunch of new game features, including the Covenant system, where you get to pick a covenant based on which campaign you want to advance, which aesthetic you like the most, and more importantly, which abilities increase your DPS the highest. That's probably the reason most people pick their Covenant. That's the reason I picked mine. Then we have Torghast, the roguelike version of World of Warcraft where you get fun abilities in order to clear it. And after doing it two times per week, you get all the Soul Ash necessary in order to advance your legendary items. We have the End Game Zone of the Maw, which is a new type of feature where you're limited on how much time you can even spend in the zone. So the very nature of the zone makes it so you can't infinitely grind it out. And then going back to the Covenants, each one has its own unique feature inside of it. The Vampires get the Ember Court, where they get to have a tea party once a week. The Night Fae get to grow plants, the Kyrian get to have a mini Brawlers Guild, and the Necro Lords get an actual useful open world combat companion that they get to create themselves. And finally, we have Soul Binds, an extra talent tree that everyone gets with their Covenants, where you get to choose and pick some of the talents you picked in the form of conduits, which is very fun and exciting. How did all these new features work out? Well, I had a very lengthy rant about the Covenants in the intro of the video, and the conduits themselves seem overly restrictive for no reason. I don't know if I'm the only one who feels this way, but you're locked into choices based on an arbitrary internal cooldown. We can only change out conduits like 10 times a week, with one of those things recharging after half a day, and the talent trees all provide pretty minor benefits and you can't have a different loadout for different specs, so your best bet is just to have a different soul bind for one of your off specs, and just hope your two specs don't share the best soul binds. And also, unlocking the entire talent tree is tied to Renown for some reason, so it just seems time-gated in order to add some kind of power of progression to the Renown system, rather than because it makes any kind of sense. It just feels incomplete to have your soul bind tree not fully unlocked when you unlock it. I mean, it's, it's fine and everything, it, it does give your character some customization and what skills and abilities you want to focus on, and it is much better to choose your Azerite traits from a tree that you can plug in, rather than having to farm out specific pieces of gear in order to get those same traits. So the Soulbind thing is a direct improvement over the Azerite gear, since that's probably the best thing to compare it to. A lot of the conduits are very similar to the Azerite abilities we had in BFA. Also, Torgas seems to have a lot of potential. Currently, it's not really there, and for half a week, the WoW community absolutely hated Torghast when Blizzard buffed the place in order to make it harder for everyone else. Before, they went back and nerfed it so people could complete the final layer so they could get their Soul Ash easier. It definitely has the potential to be a fun place and to get into some crazy builds, as if I had a couple of crazy builds on my priests, which were a lot of fun. There was one where I almost one-shot the final boss in Layer 8 run because I got lucky with a couple of traits that comboed very well with each other. And then there's other ones where I get no DPS abilities, and I couldn't kill the final boss, which just felt pretty bad. But that's just the nature of roguelike modes. It seems like a feature that definitely needs a lot of work, but it's okay the way it is now for some classes, and it wasn't even really that bad when people were complaining about it for half a week. And it was really fun in the beta when they first introduced it, and it was an endless mode. I think Blizzard is just too worried about people feeling too strong inside of Torghast, and then feeling too weak once they leave the place so they don't want to go too crazy with how strong you can get in there, which is probably a step in the wrong direction for that mode. They should just go crazy and let you do all kinds of ridiculous stuff in there like you could in the beta, where you can run through and one-shot every mob and boss once you climbed high enough. And then the Maw is probably the most controversial out of all of the new features. You can only go in there for a limited amount of time per day in order to farm a limited amount of Stygia and Rep in order to eventually unlock the extra upgrades for Torghast or the sockets for your gear. And a lot of people just hate having to run through the zone since it doesn't let you mount up. And I gotta say, I actually really like the Maw. 
One of my favorite daily activities in the game, because of how difficult it is, is just to go and do the maw. Once I found out there was a two set bonus on some of the gear you can get in there to increase your speed inside the maw by 10%, I had a lot of fun farming rares in order to get that speed buff. Although it is kind of a minor speed buff and it doesn't help anywhere near as much as I thought it would, but running at 25% move speed is still better than running at 15% movement speed, so I still wear the two set bonus. And I just like how difficult it is to move around, and how you have to be careful not to pull too many mobs. Otherwise you'll die and have to run back to your corpse in order to get your Stygia back without dying before you make it back to your corpse. And I've never gotten more use out of my mind vision than running through the maw. It's a different kind of gameplay for open world content that they've never really had before. Although, I would still really like it if I could just mount up in there. And because it's so inconvenient to get around, it did really feel nice to unlock the mini portholes and the grapple hook. The maw is definitely in its beta stages, as deer in the beta, they didn't even have it finished when Shadowlands was supposed to launch. So most of the maw that we have right now was kind of developed in that one month grace period they gave themselves when they delayed the expansion. And even as an unfinished zone, I still kind of like it. I'm not going to pretend that I hate it even though I acknowledge a lot of its faults. I totally get why a lot of people don't like it, but there's just something about it that totally appeals to me. The content is appropriately hard enough, but not too hard where it's impossible. Basically, getting gear definitely makes doing maw dailies a lot easier. The rewards are good enough to where your time is definitely worth spending in there, but not good enough where you're really forced to go there unless you're a top tier competitive player. The average player could skip them all entirely and be totally fine. You just miss out on a couple of Torgos upgrades. But the gameplay and rewards and difficulty are enough where it triggers the part of my brain that just enjoys what goes into playing MMOs. So, I can't wait to see what the maw's like when they do finally finish it. And then the specific individual features locked inside each of the covenants. They're all fine, I guess. The only one I liked the most was the build abomination factory. But really, the other three are not half bad. I obviously don't have enough experience with the Night Fae or Kyrian specific features, but no one really complains about them either. You could say I'm pretty lukewarm on the specific feature I have for my priest covenant, the Ember Court. It's a fun little mini game, but it's no abomination factory. So, long-winded features over, what I give for Shadowlands features is a 7 out of 10. Definitely better than the 5 out of 10 that I gave BFA, which was probably a little bit too high, but a 7 out of 10 seems kind of high as well considering how many problems plague a lot of the new features. But the features themselves are not inherently bad, like islands or warfronts at least. They have a lot of potential to be improved where that was really not a thing you could say about islands or warfronts. And now, class design for Shadowlands launch. It seems kind of unbalanced, although my class, the Dis Priest, is fine, especially since I chose one of the good covenants. So I'll hold off on giving it a score, but if I were to give it one, I'd probably give it a 6 out of 10, a little bit above average. Sure, some of the classes do way less DPS than others, but the balance still isn't as bad as Classic WoW, for example. And they'll probably balance it a little bit better once the devs come back from the Christmas vacation. They usually try their best to balance it out, that they won't let one class stay at the bottom of the DPS meters for too long. Well, sometimes, sometimes they'll also just let them stay there for the entire expansion. And now for game breaking bugs. BFA had a lot of bugs, or just a lot of minor bugs at launch, since they really needed to delay that expansion in order to fix a lot of stuff. Shadowlands also had a lot of bugs, and if I remember correctly, two or three realms were completely unplayable at launch, and are still having some problems right now. In my personal anecdotal experience, I haven't experienced any major bugs yet. Although, I do hear two features in the Covenant Order Hall are currently bugged, but I haven't really done any of those yet. And there's even a hilarious bug where a boss in one of the dungeons will have a Necroloid player teleport themselves outside of the dungeon, which definitely seems a little game-breaking. Although since Shadowlands doesn't seem to have a vast amount of them like BFA did, I have to give it a slightly higher score than I gave BFA had, and give it a 7 out of 10. Having a couple of realms be completely unplayable is pretty bad. Although, seeing as I didn't personally encounter any bugs myself, I can assume a lot of other people didn't encounter some as well, or just didn't encounter enough where they remember them. But if I was one of those people playing on one of those unplayable realms, I'd be pretty miffed and give it an even lower score than a 7 out of 10. Although, is an unplayable realm even counted as a bug? 
Now, the story, the lore, how's the story of the Shadowlands like? Well, like I went over a little bit when I was talking about the zones, is alright. I really like the cosmic horror of the Shadowlands they have subtly hinting at throughout the entire ordeal. Or that type of feeling. You see, cosmic horror can be described, in one way, as a fear and feeling when confronted by a phenomenon beyond your comprehension. A scope so much bigger than the narrow view of human significance that everything you do seems incredibly unimportant once you see the bigger picture for yourself. When you go into the Shadowlands for the first time, after you escape the Maw, you're greeted by a robot in Bastion, who simply asks you which planet you come from. If you're a Draenei, you get the option to pick Argus, Draenor, or Azeroth, signifying that there are many more planets out there, which is proven true as you talk to more of the denizens of Shadowlands, and pretty much everyone you come into contact with could be from one of the many different worlds, but they have no idea, since everyone you come into contact with has had their memories wiped. Which then leads into the moral dilemma of the whole zone, about whether or not you should have your memories wiped if you need to perform your job of bringing souls to the Shadowlands, which in itself seems like a pretty dreary task. You lived a full life of helping people, you formed connections with many different peoples, have a full lifetime of experiences with friends and family, and at the end of all of it you get brought into a strange new place, and are shown millions of other souls from countless other planets, and that you should erase all those experiences in order to help them move souls into the same location. And if you don't, you can be thrown into the ball where you'll just suffer for the rest of eternity. Probably way more lifetimes in which you lived as an actual living person. This would kind of go into the realm of cosmic horror, at least a variant of it. You realize just how insignificant everything you did was. And if anything, the life you lived before was just act one of the rest of your eternity. Of course, Bastion is just one of many places. If you end up in Maldraxxus, there's the possibility that, after whatever life you had, maybe betrayed or died fighting for some cause you believed in, you get thrown into a pit with a whole bunch of other people who met the exact same fate at the end of their lives and you're just kind of told to fight each other. And if you lose, your body will be stitched together with a whole bunch of other things and you'll essentially combine into an amalgamation of souls, whose experiences will all be shared with each other, and then you'll eventually lose your individuality and become a part of a collective. That's basically what all the abominations are, and there's even a quest in Maldraxxus where you see that they were forcing this fate on a whole bunch of people from Bastion, which means people who led good lives where they did the best they could ended up being put into a meat grinder and forced into a collective with a whole bunch of other souls who are no longer themselves. The souls of Ardenwald, too, have it good. They basically just get reborn and sent back, presumably without memories of their past life, whereas the Venthyr know full well about what they've done in their past life, and have to overcome all the bad things they did in order to have the opportunity to live in an 1800s aristocratic society. Not half bad as far as fates go, but there's still the underlying knowledge that everything your character did in life doesn't really matter. What actually matters is the Shadowlands itself, the afterlife, as that's where people spend way more of their time existing, and really, living is just kind of the prologue of all of it. That's why when you're questing through the zones and learn more about the people there and the lore of all the various locations, there's this underlying tone to everything, where obviously the Shadowlands is more important, and a lot of the things you accomplished in life are kind of neat trivialities, because in the face of an endless afterlife with the knowledge of an infinite amount of other worlds, your brief century of life on one planet is kind of insignificant. When you try to gain an audience with the Winter Queen, she's constantly busy with something else because, quite frankly, tending to Ardenwald is more important than whatever one person has to say to her. No one in Ardenwald really questions it either, even though they know you have important information to give to her, because the majority of the time, there isn't really anything important that she needs to know about which she can't do on her own time. In Bastion, the denizens there don't really need memories of their past life in order to do their job, because then they'd probably find out how meaningless everything is, and how everything they did never really mattered, and now they have to be tour guides for the rest of their existence. They'd probably better off not knowing that there was better time before this, and some of them even get their memories back and have this exact same epiphany. And the Venthyr get to throw tea parties and pretend to be nobles. Again, they kind of have it a little bit better off, despite the fact they're made up exclusively of people who were pretty terrible in life, and basically got turned into bad people. 
Now, cosmic horror is more normally used to describe unspeakable things, instead of a concept of something way more big than a narrow field of view of human life. So, cosmic horror is probably not the best way to describe the Shadowlands, although part of it does encompass the feeling that they were trying to get across. And I think they did a pretty good job of it if you really look past all the busy work they give you. Because essentially, you are basically just told to go out and collect things and kill stuff. They need you to do something in order to level up, but I also think they still did a good job of selling just how terrible the afterlife is. A lot of it just kind of sucks, and that's not even to mention what's going on in the Maw, where it's literally meant to just suck more than everything else. At least if you go to Maldraxxus, you have a chance to fight for your individuality. The Maw, you're just kind of constantly in agony for all of existence. In Bastion, at worst, you get turned into a fuel for some robot, or you probably don't have to exist for very much longer. If Sylvanas is trying to find some way to subvert the afterlife, I am interested in what ideas she comes up with, or what ideas Blizzard has in store for what her, their Jailer, and Denathrius were trying to do. Because I totally get why they're not too happy with the whole system of the Shadowlands. It does seem like any change is better than what they're currently doing. Although, if their plan is just to make everything like the Maw, then I'd be kind of disappointed. So here's hoping they have some really neato idea which will eventually be stopped in a raid, and then it'll just go back to whatever the Shadowlands is doing now. So yeah, basically, the lore is alright. I give it an 8 out of 10. They have some neat ideas, and they sold the feeling of the Shadowlands pretty well, and they've also set up a potential bombshell of final reveal. Although, I think they keep hyping that actual plan of Sylvanas and the Jailer up a little bit too much, to the point where no matter what it is, a lot of people are going to be disappointed. It's kind of like what happened with Season 8 of Game of Thrones. Although hopefully they don't miss the landing quite as hard as that show did. Now, let's go over the music of Shadowlands. It's pretty good. I don't think any of the zones have bad music. Generally, they have good music in World of Warcraft. They don't have anything super memorable like the Jaina Warbringers video thing, but definitely not bad either. I have to give their music a 9 or 10 out of 10. I don't really have anything wrong with it. I'm also not a music connoisseur, so I can't really talk much more about it either. And finally, my least favorite and favorite things of the expansion so far. My favorite thing of Shadowlands is definitely the Maw. Probably the most controversial thing I could like about the expansion, but there's just something about it that very much appeals to me. I also just have a general good feeling about most of the other stuff in there. It's just the Maw is kind of my favorite daily activity to do. Although, not by much. I'd still probably like doing raids or Mythic Plus dungeons more. But those are not new features of Shadowlands. And then my least favorite thing is probably the fact that I couldn't go Night Fae because the ability sucks so much. So. My least favorite things of Shadowlands is the Fae Guardian's Priest Covenant ability. Every time there's a new patch note that says there's class changes, I eagerly read through it to see if they buff the ability so I can swap to Night Fae, and then get disappointed when I see no changes. Other than that, I'm not really a huge fan of how I have to PvP to get my best trinkets, but PvP has been fun, so I'm not complaining too much about that. I do really hate how weak the Venthyr mission table people are. I still have yet to complete a Soul Ash mission, despite having most of my followers 10 levels higher than the mission level. Although, I don't really care about mission tables either, so that's not really a big concern. And I do like the auto-battler system they have for it. I just don't like that my followers are weak. So, for my favorite thing, which is the Maw, I'd probably give it a uh, 6, 6 out of 10, to be honest. I do like it, but it does have a lot of faults. And for the worst thing, the Fey Guardian ability for Night Fey. I have to give that a 4 out of 10, below average. Now, let's go to the grading scale. If we add up all the grades, I gave all the various different features and then divide the total number of the grades, we can get an average score, which rounds out to a nice 7.4 out of 10, which is definitely higher than the 6.8 out of 10 I gave Battle for Azeroth as a whole. Although, people complained I gave BFA too high of a score which definitely has some merit to it. 
There were a lot of faults people had with my BFA video that I totally agree with in hindsight. Although, I probably uh, did the same things for this launch video. I don't think a video reviewing the launch of an expansion is something to take super seriously though. Like reviewing the expansion of a whole at the end of it. So let's see if this video holds up. At the end of the expansion, where I'll make another video going over everything, and it'll be really nice to compare and contrast things from launch of the expansion to how things ended up at the end.